Ukrainian hospitality and being at the Technion, where really having very nice interaction with people so far, it's really worthwhile for, uh, for myself. And so it's, it's really a very nice experience. So uh, what uh, today, okay, so I'll talk uh, about wavelets. It's demystified in the title, so uh, I have different levels of demystification. And uh, since it's a, <coughs> a general, uh, you know, audience uh, talk, so it, I, I will, let, let's say, like, uh, try to explain also wavelets for people who are not so familiar with wavelets. And, uh, and then since my area of application is, is bioimaging, I, I will illustrate uh, the use of wavelets uh, with, with you know, some recent research projects and then show you some uh, concrete examples. <coughs> and, also, and then for you know, a little publicity for the last talk. So uh, the first one was more about sampling. Uh, uh, splines, this one will be <coughs> about wavelets and sort of the last one will be sort of the unifying view where we will bring all, all the aspects together and also make a few interesting links actually with, with many uh, different areas. Uh, so uh, I will little concentrate on, on wavelets in, in medicine and biology but uh, I mean they are obviously ap uh, applicable to many things so if we're talking about wavelets <coughs> So there, there's uh, some notation, and uh, I mean there are just uh, you know basis functions here that uh, typically if you, when one dimension we are, we are like using two indices, and it's just a family of function. They they have all the same shape, and they've be, been dilated by powers of two, and so this is the index i here where we're like just rescaling the functions by powers of two, and then what we're doing also we are translating them. But uh, of course, proportionally to the dilation factor. So if we have the fine scale, we have you know many fine wavelengths, and coarser scale, there are larger wavelengths that you know, like correspondingly fewer. Uh, so here is uh, uh, the outline of the talk. So I'll start with some motivation, and since I was talking then about demystification, so we'll <coughs> go really to the basics. So it's Legos. So with those who have kids, you know that's uh, not very relevant here to wavelengths. Uh, then we'll talk a little about how to construct uh, a basis, wavelet basis, if we like to play with Legos. And, and then I, I'll concentrate on four applications <coughs> in bioimaging. And I should say those are like uh, uh, ongoing projects uh, in, in the lab. And we'll show you, uh, you know, what you can do uh, using those tools. So a uh, general motivation for using wavelets. So why have they really become so popular? Uh, it's because they have a, a number of remarkable properties. First of all, they capture the notion of, of, of scale, not as uh, uh, compared to the Fourier transform, which captures the notion of frequency, which is a little uh, less intuitive. Uh, they are all the same basis functions, so we have this idea of self-similarity. There's actually also a very uh, a strong link with fractals. Uh, the other thing that's really uh, remarkable is that you have a basis that is a one-to-one -one representation. So if you're using, let's say, considering an image with, you know, let's say, 256 square pixels, you can represent that in a wavelet basis with 256 square wavelet coefficients. Uh, you have also like redundant versions. Uh, there's uh, some decoupling here, but uh, so th those functions can be constructed to be orthonormal, and they have some. Uh, uh, ma interesting ma uh, mathematical properties. Usually th they're sort of in understood by vanishing moments, but uh, I mean, the, the main point is if you have a signal that is piecewise smooth, it will be represented with very few uh, uh, r uh, coefficients. So that's the idea of sparsity. And actually, I, I like also very much this type of interpretation. In fact, for me, wavelets, uh, more than having vanishing moments, they are like multi scale versions of derivatives, and, and that's what makes them really very powerful. And then there's also this, some idea of localization, because uh, they give you a sort of joint localization in frequency, and like, for me it's more like space, okay, but uh, time if you're a single processing person. Uh, the class of problems, so, uh, you know, there, there may be more, okay, but for, let's say, single processing people, the class of problems are data compression, and so there, you know what was remarkable, like you know, let's say 10 years after you know, the big wavelet splash, uh, uh, wavelets made it into a compression standard, uh, JPEG 2000, so that uh, numbers 
you know, quite impressive how math can work their way, you know, into a, into a standard. Uh, today, I, I won't talk too much about data compression. I'll talk a little more about data processing so that you can be denoising, solving inverse problems, and that, that will be you know, the, one of the issues today. And of course, you can also do very interesting data analysis, characterization of singularity, texture, fractals, etc. etc. And I'll show you some with uh, functional MRI uh, of, uh, you know, like, uh, of the brain. And uh, there's also like a computational paradigm hiding behind wavelets. So this idea of multi-resolution, which is you know, a, a sort of old theme also in computer vision, but here made very explicitly, uh, the idea of also having very fast algorithms. Because you have, let's say, order n, where n is the number of your samples. So it's, you cannot be faster. And the, also the idea of uh, introducing prior knowledge uh, through the uh, uh, sparsity constraints. So that's something we'll be exploiting today. A little uh, talking about, uh, you know, like the use of wavelets in, in, in bioimaging. And, and so, I mean, I was involved like in like a sort of reviewing a little the literature and, 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 and looking, you know, at you know, what, what people had done with wavelets uh, in, in many areas, but so in, in, in bioimaging, okay, so there, there, there are all kinds of things that have been done, of course, like compression, but that's the trivial, uh, I mean, extension, but filtering, uh, I'll show you some, so how you can do uh, image enhancement, uh, enhancement for detecting microclassification in mammograms, how you can do noise reduction, and, and, and all this originated in, in medical imaging. You can do uh, feature extraction, texture analysis, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of interesting things uh, using wavelets. People have even used wavelets for doing MR uh, wavelet encoding. So they tr transform the MR uh, pulse sequence so that you measure the wavelet transform of your subject. Okay? That, uh, uh, and, and, and actually now they're also being used in very modern uh, state-of-the-art algorithms. Uh, uh, image reconstruction, in, 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 and so that will also be the topic of the talk today. Computer tomography, uh, uh, you know, uh, optical tomography, PET, uh, uh, SPECT, uh, and, and uh, even MRI. Uh, statistical uh, analysis, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about functional imaging, multi-scale registration, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, so it's just to tell you that there are many, many uh, places where people have uh, applied wavelets. So now let's go back to the very basics. And so I apologize for you know the many, many of you who are wavelet specialists, but for the others that may be worthwhile. And, and so here's the hard transform. Okay. So let's suppose now we have a signal. So there are just samples, and we are assuming it is piecewise constant. Why not? So it would be like a computer scientist's view of a signal. And uh, now we are given the very difficult problem of trying to make a coarser approximation of that signal. Now instead of using little Legos as, as we have here, uh, and, and the Legos here are represented by this rectangular function, and actually if you just put that in equation, you have a weighted sum of translated Legos, and here are the heights of your Legos. Okay, so it's just make it very concrete. So now let's say, you want to play with someone with Duplos, okay? So Duplos are, you know, la uh, coarser versions of Legos. And so you, you would like, so I, say I'm very basic. So you'd like to represent that using Duplos. So how, how do you do? Okay, so you'd like to do that, okay? Good representation of the signal. So, you know, what's your wild guess? I mean, <laughs> I won't ask you, but uh, the wild guess of the optimal algorithm would be just take the average between, you know, like two of those neighboring numbers and assign them here and you know like use a larger basis function <coughs> and so you can do that all over and, and and then you get this representation I, I just like to appreciate you to appreciate a little the notation so with i here goes with the scale and so that was i zero this is i one just always powers of two so i have the i here that's put on the basis function so that means it just has been dilated by the power of two and of course, the coefficient has changed, okay? So k goes with that, and uh, the i goes with the scale, and so those are just averages, okay? And so then, a uh, wavelet is about recursive filtering, uh, no, recursive thinking, so how, how do I go on? You know, larger deep flows, okay? 
same thing, average, etc., etc. And oh, I'm finished. Okay, so that's how you can construct a multi-resolution view of the world. Okay? And uh, so that's uh, not quite well, but by the way, this is the important part behind wavelengths, okay? So that's very simple. So now, what happened, okay? Now, let's think about it. We had like eight numbers, we crunched it down to four numbers, and in fact, we're doing a kind of projection here, so you sort of feel that the residue, I mean, the residue, if we're doing the difference here, should not really be like uh, eight degrees of freedom, maybe less, okay? Let's look at the residue. Hmm. Okay, looks like that. It's very patterned. And in fact, it always has this funny, like, oscillation. Why? Okay, because here we were doing the average, and there's always one point that's above the average, one that's below, exactly at the same distance. So you, you automatically have that, okay? So now how can we, like, in a smart way, represent uh, uh, this residue. Let's just take a basis function that looks like this oscillation. And now if we just put in four such basis function with the height corresponding here to this value, uh, I have a representation of the residue. So, okay, so that allows me to call the difference here with four numbers, okay? So I, I, I had eight numbers, I have four here, and I have four here. So then I can do it again, difference here, here, too, you get those oscillations, so I can also encode that, but now I need to do larger wavelets. Now I can code it with two numbers. And then, okay, difference between here, again, the oscillation here, and I can code that with one number. So if we just wrap up here, summarize the situation, so we, if we just add up all those residues, and of course we should not forget, uh, you know, the, the final mean here, we get back the signal, and, 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 and in fact, this is the wavelet transform. So what we did, we sort of, you know, did multi-resolution representation, and we were just coding in a smart way the, the, the differences between, you know, like uh, two successive uh, approximations. Okay, so now, I mean, how, how can we sort of generalize that? So what we need is something that would be a little better than the Lego. I, I love Legos, but they are sort of discontinuous, okay? And uh, so we, instead, more general, uh, we want to use a function phi of x that we, you already saw last time, but this one has a few more properties. And we will call it a, a scaling function of L2 of r, if and only if. There's three conditions. So if you want to design your wavelet this evening, okay, that's uh, the three conditions you need. The first one is the risk basis condition. So for the, those who were here during the first talk is the same thing, okay? So what you have here, you have some measure, uh, a, a norm or energy in the continuous domain because, you know, the, your functions are linear combination of those Legos, and so you'd like to compute the energy but <coughs> using an integral, and now this should be, you know, like proportional to the energy of the coefficients that you would uh, measure using a sum. So you have an equivalence between the continuous domain norm the discrete domain norm, and I told you last time you can almost draw anything, and you really have to scratch your head to find the function that will not satisfy that. Okay, so that's not hard. Uh, two scale relation. So that's the Lego Duplo uh, uh, con uh, uh, um, <coughs> relation. Actually, it is if you if you have kids, and if you have Legos, and if you have Duplos, you may have noticed that you can assemble them. They're compatible. Okay, so the small kids can. Play with with the older ones. Why why so? Because if I take a Duplo like a, a Lego uh, expanded by two, I could construct it by putting two small Legos. And mathematically, this means if I'm expanding my function by a power of two, I should be able to generate this function expanded, taking a linear combination of the finer resolution basis functions. Okay, and this is really the key idea behind wavelets. Uh, this two-scale relation is also uh, sometimes uh, it means that, you know, like uh, phi is refinable. <coughs> and the last condition is more technical. <coughs> I'm sorry. So it just means if you take your function phi and you just stack it up, you're taking all the translates with weights 1, it should sum up to 1. And you may ask yourself, why do I need that? But that you need for mathematical convergence reasons. 
And actually, if you don't have that, it doesn't work. So every wavelet out there, I mean, big dodeshi, which looks like a fractal or anything, I mean, if you take the, the corresponding function phi and you, you, you put it like that, it will add up to 1. It's guaranteed. It cannot work otherwise. And that's, uh, I mean, those two are, are more specific, okay? So then, once you have the wavelets, then, I mean, then you can start playing, uh, I mean, your scaling functions. So then, what you can do, you can, uh, you know, rescale them, uh, and, and, and you have your, your multi-resolution representation of signals, and, and those actually correspond to, to Hilbert spaces, but which are embedded, and so you can define the space at any resolution. Now, what you'll notice is, now this space is included in this one, this space is included in this one. It's like Russian dolls, you know, like, a, like the analogy here. And uh, uh, why so? It's be because of this Lego Duplo relations, the two scale relation. Uh, and uh, so this implies the embedding. And then the partition of unity, so this is a little more subtle, but uh, the, the uh, implication of the partition of unities, if you make the space go very, 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 very fine, you, you essentially can represent anything, okay? And it means that if you take the union of all the spaces, actually, you just need to take the very fine one, and <coughs> uh, if you do the closure of that, you, you get the complete space, the back space of finite energy functions. And actually, actually just got it by the three little properties. So once you have a scaling function, then there's a theorem by Mala Meyer, uh, that tells you you can always design wavelets. And actually, you can design as many as you want, okay, but maybe you prefer an orthonormal one, so there's, uh, there's maybe one orthonormal one. <coughs> and how will you construct it? You will just make it again as a linear combination of, of basis functions. So if your basis functions are Legos, okay, you can just adjust the weights of the Legos and you know, come up with that. In fact, here's a Lego, here's another Lego with weights one minus one. <coughs> and, and then you can construct that such that this thing here is, is a basis of L2. So now what you need now is all the shifts and all the dilations. And this will be a basis. And actually this was remarkable. I mean, when that was discovered by Malay Meyer, and this really got all the community completely excited because though the, there weren't so many bases known for, <coughs> you know, L2 of R space. Yes? Uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, I mean, you can have both. <laughs> and, and by the way, if you have a risk basis, you can always autonormalize. In fact, the, the condition of the risk basis, the guarantee that it always exists, an autonormal basis. And, and the risk basis is more general. Actually, we don't always want autonormality, or always, or, although it's, it's sort of convenient. But uh, I mean, there's a, it's guaranteed there's always one autonormal wavelet, okay, if for any function file that satisfies the three properties, and there's zillions that are risk basis, so you can choose the one you prefer, okay. So now, how, how do you do it? Actually, then it's quite mechanical, because then it, actually it was work that had been solved by single processors before wavelets, and, and it boils down to considering a, a perfectly constructed filter bank. So we had, you know, the filter H, that was the two-scale relation, so they go duplo, let's say 1-1, one, one, this filter here. And now you just have to choose three other filters such that this uh, satisfies a perfectly constructed filter. And, and, and I mean this, you can just put an equation. There are, there are many, many possibilities here to, to choose those filters. And if you have perfect reconstruction, you'll have the basis, etc. etc. So now let's <coughs> take a, a fresher look at the Lego. And, and that's how I want you to look also for my next talk. Okay? So, and, and, and this is sort of illuminating in some sense. Now there's an association with operators. It's maybe not obvious, but okay. Uh, at first sight, so if you have the derivative, you all know that the derivative in the Fourier domain is j omega. If you are a pure computer scientist, you know, you don't believe in things like derivatives, but at least you, you can take the difference between two samples, okay? So that's the fine difference operator. Now, how does that uh, relate uh, to, to Legos, okay? So, here's a complicated way of, of constructing a Lego, but it's very, very powerful conception. 
take the inverse of the derivative. It's an integral, okay? Integration operator. What is the impulse response of an integration step? Okay? There's a step. Step doesn't look like a Lego, but it's not a big deal. Now we can easily get our Lego out of it. So what do we do? We take a step, we move it by one, subtract, and check, we chop it off, and we are here with our Lego. <coughs> now let's interpret here. Here is a formula. So this x plus zero, I mean, it's a fancy notation for say, saying the unit step, okay? So what I'm doing, I'm doing the finite difference of the, the unit step, and I'm getting my Lego. But let's look at it in the Fourier domain. In the Fourier domain, what do we have? Well, okay, you all know what's the Fourier transform of the rect. It's a sink, but here it's a combo, a rectangle. And so it's like a sink, but you know, up to a face factor. And what do you recognize there? Huh. I mean, this is very, very, very important, okay? Because, I mean, there are tons of generalization that can come out of it, okay? I see the poor man's version of the derivative, which is up there divided by the real thing, okay? So the Fourier domain, I'm comparing, you know, the poor man's operator with the true operator, and the ratio between the two gives me my basis function. So this is uh, something where we'll, we'll see again, you know, like in two days, okay? But uh, anyway, we wanted to generalize a little bit also. Uh, in the Fourier domain, I just showed you this, this formula. Now, last talk, I, I showed you that if you take a uh, rectangle, convolve it with itself, you get a triangle, which is a B-spline of degree 1, and you can go on and go on, and you construct the family of B-splines, and we'll see them next time also. So we had a weird idea. You know, why not do uh, not non-integer powers? Okay, so it's, I mean, it's, uh, it looks like a trivial idea. So here, instead of putting integer powers like people have always been doing, why not allow for arbitrary powers? And actually, if you do that, okay, then you can scratch your head a little, but you can even find the nice formula in the time domain. And, uh, okay, it involves, like, functions that are x plus to the power alpha. So this function somehow is piecewise x to the alpha. Now, uh, let me run you uh, uh, the movie. So here is, uh, so the Lego. <laughs> and now we'll see fractional Legos, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> it's more fancy. We have to, uh, I'm not yet convinced Lego to manufacture those. Uh, and, and so look at that. Okay, so here we are just, uh, uh, you know, like increasing the degree. Oops, let's go it again maybe. <coughs> and uh, so you get functions that get smoother and smoother and eventually look like Gaussians. And of course, you know, my sister can always make very nice things out of that. And uh, then, I mean, it's one property here. These guys are valid scaling functions. So uh, we can prove there is basis. We can prove the scale relation. We can prove the partition of unity. Therefore, we're in business. We can start doing wavelengths. Uh, let us look at this uh, Lego Duplo relation. Lego Duplo relation. Uh, okay, so the filter here, if we had just uh, alpha equals zero, would be one, one. Actually, if you write this formula here, uh, if you don't go in the Fourier domain, you can, you know, solve it for this filter H that you may not know, okay, you want to find. And actually, I just gave you the, the Fourier transform, so you can do this ratio. If you do the arithmetic, it's the one line, you find this, okay? So, essentially, here what you find is the filter 1, 1 convolved with itself, you know, alpha plus one time. And so, if you expand that, you get binomial coefficients. And actually, if you have fractional here, you get generalized binomial coefficients, which are related to, uh, to the gamma function. And actually, this works quite well. Let's here take alpha 1. Okay, it's 1, 1. Here, uh, 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 you know, uh, I, I mean, it's 1 plus z to the power 2. We expand this binomial coefficient, so it's, it's 1, 2. So if we take small triangles, wait, 1, 2, 1, and actually it's divided by 2, so it's 1 half, 1, 1 half, stack them up, it just works, okay? It gives you a triangle uh, uh, dilated by two, and it works for all those guys. So just to show that you get the two-scale relation. And then you can construct wavelets. Okay, so just uh, those wavelets are not orthonormal. They're risk basis, but they're very pretty. <laughs> and uh, 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 so, so those guys, I mean, they're splice. 
And they are about the only wavelets you'll see that where you can write down an analytical formula. And uh, so, so it's exactly the wavelets that go with the yeast finds, and I can show you, uh, sh uh, play you the movie, but look at those. Uh, they look like a sort of uh, modulated Gaussians, and uh, they get smoother and smoother. Let me play it again. So now what I can do, I can just stop on any of those, and I have the basis of all of L2. So any one of those functions, you know, gives you uh, a representation of all finite energy functions, and so it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very large family. Okay, what are the remarkable properties? So then you have uh, real spaces. Now, okay, so once we have those wavelets that you know, have been constructed like that, and there are many others, Dubishi, etc., uh, you, 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 you can like uh, consider it. You have your wavelets, now you can make them orthonormal. Uh, I mean, it's very simple. Uh, you can orthonormalize them. They get, beca become a little ugly. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. But uh, I mean, they, at least they are orthonormal. And, 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 and then, uh, okay, so they satisfy the orthonormality property. If it's orthonormal, somehow the, uh, you, you know, the uh, transform is, in, uh, I, I mean, the adjoint corresponds to the inverse. How do you get wavelet coefficient? You get into the inner product, and actually there's this very fast mass multibank algorithm. So here I'm just representing the wavelet coefficients, but uh, of an of of MRI image. And you have also the, the reconstruction formula. So if I just take those weights, put in front the base function, I reconstruct exactly uh, the image. And what's important here, I have, let's say, 256 square values. I have 250 square values here. And they're just much smaller. And from now on, I, I use the matrix notation. So I, 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 I make matrix vector. So I'll, I'll say my vector, my in, uh, signal, I put it in a vector s, my wavelet coefficient I put in the vector w. Uh, the, this is a linear transformation, so uh, I, I, I use it, the matrix w, and, 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 and uh, because here I'm assuming it's orthonormal, so I, I can come back by taking uh, the inverse which corresponds to the transpose. Now, how do you do that in, in, in 2D? Uh, so my advice is don't think, just do. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and so what you have essentially the, uh, the uh, wavelet uh, algorithm like splits into sums and differences, okay? So, and this is one level. So what you do, you, you, you code your 1D algorithm, you take line of the image, you split it in two without thinking, it goes through, through, through all the, the, uh, the, the rows here, and then there you should really not think, okay? Then you take all those things, all the columns, and you just split them in two, and, and you're done. Okay, so so that's uh, and, and and but but okay. What you get here is, is algorithmic, but it corresponds to tensor products. So it's the way you, uh, I, I mean, you just adapt a, a one D transform to multi dimensions, and then you can start again with the multi uh, your wave representation. So now here, this is, I think is an important picture here because this is the picture that. Uh, when I show it uh, to my dear wife, uh, she understands what I wait, but she's a biologist. Okay. <laughs> but uh, um, so uh, here you, you have your, you know, like PET scan we saw the other day, the wavelet the representation, and here I'm, I'm showing the absolute value of the wavelet coefficient. So where it's black, it's essentially zero. So now what we'll do, we'll start throwing away coefficients starting, of course, by the very small ones, and we, we start uh, throwing away. And so what you'll see, you'll see a mask that will be moving over the picture here that shows you which ones we have thrown away. And then what you have to uh, notice, you know what happens to our poor cats when we start uh, throwing away wavelet coefficients. Okay, so here we're throwing away a lot, a lot. Shh, shh, shh. Look, it doesn't care, okay? Uh, except now, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, at the end, uh, okay, so it becomes a little ugly. <coughs> you know, that's, uh, you know, about people doing, doing compress sensing. <laughs> what can happen if you go a little too far? But, uh, okay, I, I mean, here you see that the, the message here is just if you, you know, you, it's quite robust, can throw away many, many coefficients and, you know, virtually not much effect uh, on, on the root structure. And so this is the idea of sparse representation. So, uh, illustrated visual. 
So now let me talk to you about a, a few concrete projects. So there's wavelet denoising, and I'm listening here, the people in, in my lab were working on that. There's a way that regularizes 3D deconvolution, so that's, uh, uh, I mean, it's uh, quite challenging data because of size, so that's for my microscopy. The analysis of functional imaging data, uh, and, and then uh, extended depth of focus, it's a sort of uh, image fusion. And the two last ones I, I, I will not discuss, but I just want to mention them. Here we're looking at reconstruction of dynamic positron emission tomography, so it's a let's say 2D plus time, or, or even 3D plus time global problem uh, using also wavelets. And I mean, this one, this one is really hard. We just started, but this optical diffusion tomography, it's a very, very challenging inverse problem. So it's so hard, I think I, I will still have to wait a year before I can show you some results. Um, okay, so the first published paper on, on wavelets in uh, actually, this when I was doing this review many years ago, like for the proceeding of IEEE, uh, I, I mean, this was the first paper I found, the earliest paper in bio on wavelengths. 91, okay, because, uh, you know, my paper came out in 89, okay, so that they can publish faster there, okay, two years later, we already have the application, but, uh, I mean, they, so it was MR data, so it, it came out in magnetic resonance in medicine, and they were describing a, a very, very popular algorithm nowadays, which is called soft thresholding, and actually they were visionary, because they were also writing, there are many possible extensions of this filter, and, and they were just showing a few, and I think to date it's fair to say there might be at least be 500 papers, you know, on variation on this algorithm. I mean, the, the sad part is no one uh, cites that paper. No one knows that paper, but that's maybe you know where, 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 where it was first proposed. Okay, so what is the, the basic idea? Uh, uh, an orthonormal transform in general takes white noise, transforms it into white noise, and, and so uh, and, and otherwise for the signal, I mean, just gets concentrated in, in few coefficients, and and then I mean it's very simple. E everywhere where it's small, you say it's noise, and just put it to zero. And actually, the authors in of that very old paper proposed to do it in a smooth fashion using a soft threshold. And uh, okay, so I mean, this now is very, very uh, well-established technique. And okay, I, I will not say too much here. But okay, there was David Dono, who very fine uh, a statistician. He, he he had you know like uh, some good you know like just statistical justification. And yet also the idea of sparsity and and. Of course, I mean, Donoho's paper has, has many, many citations. I mean, this one, okay. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I've, a few people I mean, have seen it, but uh, I, I mean, for those I interested, like in history of science, I think it's, it's worthwhile to look at this paper because it really has exactly the algorithm. But it's purely empirical, okay? They, 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 they were engineers, they took the MR data, they applied the algorithm. They reconstructed, they saw it works much better than anything else they knew. <coughs> they were very excited, okay? And so that was the thing. Uh, and, uh, but now, okay, so there are uh, a sort of rational uh, uh, formulations of, of uh, uh, this, the same algorithm that are more sophisticated. And, and, and so what you have, so that works for noise. So you have signal plus noise. If you translate that in the wet domain, you still have signal plus noise. And so here we will try to now recover the noise-free signal. And so the way we do it, okay, we want to alter the wavelet coefficients and reconstruct in such a way that, okay, I mean, <laughs> it's a better uh, 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 estimate of our signal. And actually the way it is that it's done sort of standard variation setting. So we are putting a data term, so we are reconstructing a signal and we want to impose that it's reasonably close to, to your noisy measurement, but okay, then you want also to put in some prior knowledge, and so we have to put in via a regularization function, and so how can you measure sparsity or smoothness? <coughs> yeah, a good way is to take the L1 norm of the wavelet condition. So there are many reasons for that. This one rather sophisticated reason is this, because that can be shown to, to be uh, a, a, an equivalent norm of a Bezoff one one space, which is something like total variation, not quite, but it's very close to total variation. 
Okay, so, so then you put that, you put Lagrange multiplier, and you have to minimize this cross functional. Now, you know, why is this a good problem? It's completely decoupled, exactly as I show here. You have this sum, I can break it. And, and then, essentially here, this is your data in the wavelet domain. Okay, the, the wavelet transform of the noisy image. This is the, the, the wavelet you want, the coefficient you want to, to create, okay? And you're having a penalty here. And, and you see that's completely decoupled, so you can uh, solve it you know, for any scalar component here. And then, uh, actually, it's just something like that. Okay, so the, the input is u, which is this, and you want to find v that minimize that. Okay, so it's, I mean, the solution of that, actually, I could put anything here. It could just be a mapping of u to v. Yes, it's, it's nothing else, okay? So it's a nonlinear mapping from u to v, but which one? Actually, if you do the math, surprise, surprise, not so surprised, everyone knows it now, you get this, okay? But, uh, I mean, it took a long time to be discovered, okay? From, from the time, you, you know, the algorithm was, uh, was uh, uh, proposed. Okay, so the solution here is, is the ratio. And actually, there are some variations. Uh, so, so what you have here is a nonlinearity that you apply in the wavelet domain. So actually, we did some work where we try to generalize the nonlinearity, and maybe you could do like a Bayesian nonlinearity, etc. So we had an interesting idea where uh, we, we did the linear combination of nonlinearities, and we used a, a sort of like sure estimate to get the weights of the linear combination from the data. And actually, this, this works quite well. I just show you here's a noisy image after the noise in the wave domain, and actually this thing is, is you know almost 1.5 dB better than just the, the software show. But just to show you, let's say it's to show you that uh, if you go in the wavelet domain, you do something very simple, which is like a portwise processing. You, you can do very well. And actually what's remarkable is it works better than the Wiener filter. You know, the, the Wiener filter that would know the whole power spectrum of the signal, you know, that has zillions of degrees of freedom, except that it's a uh, sh shift invariant filter. But this, I mean, almost trivial, simple algorithm works better than, than uh, uh, you know, something, uh, you know, like quite standard. Like, so now, how can we apply that to solve uh, inverse problems? Now, uh, it, okay, so, so here what we have now is an unknown image. And now suppose it went through your imaging system. Now suppose it's a microscope, okay? So the microscope, unfortunately, has a limited resolution. So what you're getting is blurred version of, of you know, the signal you like plus noise. And so we would like to start again, okay? So um, <coughs> uh, try to recover the signal. And since this wavelet denoising works so well, okay, so let's use the same strategy, okay? So now it's just in, you have a data term, but instead of, you know, the, the reconstructed signal, it's the reconstructed signal that's going to the imaging system that you should compare to the measurements. And uh, since the sparsity or L1 known works so, so well, we put the constraint on the wavelet coefficient. And so then we write the optimization problem, and then it's a convex optimization problem, and, uh, and you try to solve that. Now the amazing thing, and, and actually Miki Elad has been very much involved in that, there's a very, very nice algorithm that can solve that problem that looks a little complicated. And certainly you should never use tools from convex analysis to, to solve that. You, here is, it is a simple iterative uh, technique, and uh, actually, uh, <laughs> I'll show you in a, in a while. Maybe uh, let me just uh, uh, motivate why 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 this L1 norm is is, is reasonable. Now uh, you know in all the days, you know, computers were not quite as powerful. This was uh, the way we were approaching uh, uh, inverse problems. Okay, so we had the quadratic data term and the quadratic pen penalty. Now this thing here is equivalent to minimizing. Let's say the data term subject to uh, constraints on, 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 on the solution here. So with the L2 constraint, so means the solution uh, is here, if it's equality, should lie somewhere on, on the boundary of this circle, which is your L2 ball. Now, well, if you look at this part here, so this depends on the data, U, but uh, I mean, you can just see this thing. In fact, it's an elliptical norm. And, and, and so there's a center that depends on the data, and otherwise, you know, a constant uh, distance here corresponds to an ellipse. So if you want to solve that problem, you're inflating your ellipse such that it touches the circle. 
And so that's your, this I, I would say is your Tikhonov uh, old style solution, which is somewhere here. Now if you put the L1 constraint instead, now the L1 ball, it is a, a simplex here, it means a square. Now if you inflate your ellipse, and you can try to put it wherever you want, most of the time you, you hit a corner. And what does it mean to hit the corner? On the corner, I have only this corner that is non-zero, and the other one is zero. So hitting a corner means being sparse. And by the way, if I, if I take smaller, you know, quasi-norms, I mean, pseudo-norms, like L smaller than, uh, P smaller than one, this thing even becomes more pointy. And, and so then you're really guaranteed to be sparse. And actually, if you add more dimensions, it's even more dramatic. Okay? So this is sort of, you know, why, why is all this thing uh, good to give sparse solution? So putting this L1 norm here is extremely popular right now, all this uh, sparse, uh, no, present in people, etc. And I must say, this, this type of picture was shown by Dono. So if, I mean, he, he deserves <laughs> a good part of citations, okay? <laughs> But, uh, and, and we saw that very, very, very early. Um, now, okay, what I wanted to say that there's a very efficient algorithm to solve this sort of complicated looking problem. It's complicated because it's so huge, okay? And so, I mean, the, the trick here, it's almost like a four or five lines derivation. I, I will not really go into details, but you want to minimize that. So what you do, you, you create a surrogate uh, a cost function around uh, operating point, which is sort of your current estimate, that will uh, 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 matterize your cost. But if you set it as n equal f n, the same. Okay. <coughs> and and uh, I mean you can do that by adding some factors. You just have some condition on the spectral radius of, of your imaging operator. So you you add stuff to your uh, uh, to your criteria, but you you add it such a way. That at the end of the day, it, it looks like that. Okay, so essentially, what you don't like here is the fact that you're comparing uh, y to h f because you don't like this h. Okay, because if you didn't have the h, you could do uh, soft threshold. So you just manipulate that stuff, and then after manipulation, I mean, it looks like f minus z. Okay, the h has disappeared. This is an auxiliary variable. And, and then it's, it's a sort of very trivial problem. And actually, this boils down to this algorithm. It's, it's called threshold land vendor. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a wonderful algorithm because it, it's, uh, it uses this two, uh, let's say, I, I could say, quote, dumbest possible algorithms <coughs> we can imagine that just change in the right <coughs> way. So what you do, first step here, you com compute the update. What is the update? It's a steepest descent on the gradient, uh, no, on the data term. Steepest descent, so it's, and it's not even a steepest descent on the whole thing. It's just on the data term. So this is a historical algorithm. Okay, long paper just doing that. So, I mean, it's nine years of decomposition we're doing that, and then okay, then you, you're solving this problem, which you know how to solve it, and and so that gets the cost function smaller. So you're solving the other decomposing problem, which you know is a threshold, and you iterate. So you're doing long paper thresholding, long paper thresholding, and Amazingly, Dodeshi, the Mol, the Fees have shown that this thing would converge, but there, there were also like people in the signal processing community, Figueredo, Novak, and actually even Stark, uh, in some very early paper, he was sort of alluding to some kind of algorithm like that before the others, but I mean, he was just using it empirically and he had, uh, he had observed it seemed to work. So now, this is it's very powerful, but, and it always works, but it's a little slow. So. Uh, it will convert like in 500 steps. So you say, okay, it's okay if you're doing images, but if you're doing microscopy in 3D, 500 iteration it equal a week. <laughs> no, not quite, but almost a day. So we were try trying to make it faster. So what was our idea here? We used Shannon wavelet basis. So and and uh, so there are just wavelets that would act like ideal filters. And by the way, they correspond to splines of very high order. And so the idea here is it will, uh, I mean, produce, uh, 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 you, you, you know, like wavelets with disjoint uh, spectral support. And now since we're looking at the deconvolution problem, so the imaging operator is, uh, uh, you know, uh, a convolution, therefore it's diagonalized in the Fourier domain, 
and therefore it's block diagonalized by those wavelets. And what, therefore what we can do, we can take the cost function, we can chop it in small pieces that are completely independent, and then we can run the algorithm on each small piece. And there also a miracle happens because, I mean, it's sort of done on purpose, but it is just, what, what is the uh, rate of convergence of the Landweber algorithm? It depends here, uh, uh, you know, on, 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 on uh, actually, the larger the discrepancy between the, uh, the larger and smaller eigenvalue is, the, small, the slower the algorithm, because it's the condition. And now if you chop it in sub-bands, now what happens, okay? They, I mean, the ratio become much better. So not only the ratio become much better, but it's, well, it's decoupled. I mean, the whole thing becomes you know, orders of magnitude better condition. And at the end of the day, this thing converges, you know, like orders of magnitude faster than the other algorithm. And, and so here are, are, are some illustration. Uh, so, uh, here, so we applied the algorithm to 3D data for the convolution. And so this was running, uh, you know, the Dobeshi uh, actually uh, uh, called the cube algorithm. Uh, and, and it would take about 600 iterations to converge if you were like doing our uh, decomposition subbands, and, you know, we would get there after, you know, a, a few steps. So, so this, uh, I mean, it's, it's rare that in, 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 you, in your <laughs> work you encounter orders of magnitude uh, increase in speed and there I, I really have like uh, I mean it's my, uh, my student like uh, Cedric I mean that uh, that was uh, I think a, a, a major achievement and so this is real data okay so this is fluorescence uh, micrographs in 3D of that size here what we are looking is at uh, maximum intensity projection okay so, so here is the uh, input data blurred after the convolution. It's real data. Uh, it's, uh, uh, we use the PSF that was uh, uh, using a physical model that was matched to the characteristic of the objective. And here is some other real data. Actually, uh, Cedric is a you know, very dedicated student. I mean, he went in the lab. He acquired the, uh, the confocal uh, I mean, and the microscopy images. And so here's like, uh, you know, different labels, like uh, what is actin filament in green, vesicle nuclei in red. So that's uh, fluorescent labeled micrographs, 3D. So what he did then is he ran five iterations. So he, he, he ran five iterations of the, you know, the cube algorithm. You, you almost get nowhere, okay? So it's uh, essentially uh, a little unblurred, but not much. So five iterations of, of uh, the accelerated algorithm. And you have deconvolved. Now, this is an image obtained using a white mic microscope. Order of magnitude, size, I don't know, good quality, maybe 10,000 10, euros, 20,000 euros. Okay, so what we, as gold standard, we compare it to a confocal microscope, which has a better resolution, but the price, 200,000 euros. Okay, so here's the 200,000 euro image. That's a 10,000 euro image. And uh, it's, it's quite, I, I mean, this is obtained by optics, better optics, okay, with the pinhole. And, and, and this is like, without the pinhole using, uh, you know, the, the convolution. And, 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 and actually, this is an area where people really want to use the convolution and where it can really help, like, for, for doing this kind of person's microscopy. Okay, uh, uh, last, last example, wavelet analysis of fMRI. So here the, the idea is to, you know, like uh, uh, take images of the brain and what we like to do is uh, lo locate areas of, of, of uh, neural activation. And so this is the bold uh, contrast of in MRI. It's, it's, it's sort of measuring like uh, oxygenation of, of, of the brain indirectly. It's very noisy and usually what one does it's, this is the so-called block-based paradigm. It's so noisy that one kind of repeats the experiment. Now, in our case, the experiment was listening not to music, but some tones. So the subject, who was another one of my students <laughs> in the scanner, uh, was uh, listening to some nice sinusoids for, during the moment, and then doing nothing, sleeping, <laughs> listening to sinusoids, doing nothing, etc. So you acquire the data. 
And it's, uh, I mean, you have to be dedicated to go to Scala to do that. So we, all our students at EPF are really dedicated. And, 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 and then, okay, you get, uh, here's the time course, uh, uh, you know, uh, of, of this type of measurement at, at one particular pixel. So it's extremely noisy. And, and then we're trying out of here to infer which part of the brain is it active. And, and so how do you do that? Uh, the standard paradigm is, is to fit a model. Because now what happens is nothing, and then there's no activation. Okay, then it's all the, 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 the blood flow and all that. So you have some model, differential system, for the response of the blood flow. I mean, it's, it's relatively slow. It's a few seconds, okay, it takes to 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 to, uh, to response there, and and, and 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 so this is this is sort of you know like uh, priming the model with impulses every, every time there's the, the, the paradigm, and so the, you are trying to fit the model uh, uh, to the noisy data, and now uh, I mean the, the question is, is is that thing present or not? Okay, versus uh, you know flat background, and so you're doing like a kind of least square fit. And uh, okay, so you can get those coefficients using these squares, and you look at the residues. And so generally, you would like to do statistics beside at a given location. It's the y one is it there or, or zero? Okay. So now the idea here uh, was the point. Now people, I, I mean, they do that. There's a software that does that. Does that? That's called SPM. You know what it does first? It takes the fMRI data, and the data is very noisy. So the first thing they do, they they smooth it with the Gaussian filter, you know, huh? <laughs> and it's very irritating because those guys just uh, paid one million euro <laughs> to buy the latest scanner, and then the first thing they do, they blur it with the Gaussian filter. Mm -hmm. That was not so great. Eh? So uh, you know, why not try something else? So something else uh, being wavelets, uh, and you know, some advantages. You you can exploit correlation, you get increased signal to noise ratio in the wave domain, there's no loss of information and uh, multi-resolution. So now if you look at the, the wavelet transform along space, the time model is still true for every wavelet coefficient. Okay, so you can still put the linear model along the time. The noise stays white, so you can use essentially the same uh, procedures, but now the problem is Maybe, okay, you, you get some detection in the wavelet domain, and you don't like that too much. You would like to map it back in, into the space domain, and so that, uh, for that we, we proposed what we call the integrated framework. And it works like that. Okay, so you take your sequence of images, noisy images of the brain, take the wavelet transform. In the wavelet domain, so you have a sequence, a series of, of such things. Now you'll fit the linear model. So this is the Y1, okay? The, the weight of the hemodynamic response uh, you know, uh, for different positions. But then what you also compute, you compute some standard deviation. Because you're doing this least square fit, you have also some estimate of the standard deviation. And then what you do, based on the T value here, you will just select the locations you know which you think there's something happening. And then what you do, you just keep those guys <coughs> where you, de you, you decided this was active, you map them back into the space domain. But now the thing was, you know, putting some statistical inference in the space domain. Because, uh, I mean, we can say, okay, here, yeah, you have something in the wavelet domain, but what is it in the space domain? So what we needed to do is also, like, sort of propagate some kind of standard deviation back in the space domain, but we needed to do that using uh, absolute value wavelets. Okay, so here is essentially the, the thing. So there's this ad adaptive thresholding reconstruction. But then what we have, we have a foolproof, uh, conservative way of, of checking if you have uh, activity here based on a statistical test that looks a little like a t-test, but uh, based on uh, rigorous mathematics. And so we can control the level of significance. Actually, what we're doing here, we're doing very conservative Monferroni correction. Because we are dividing by the number of pixels in the image, and there are zillions of pixels. And so, if we find something uh, significant, there's you know, really something. So let me just show you some pictures here. So this is the brain of a courageous mm -hmm. student. Mm -hmm. uh, after uh, uh, <laughs> running his own wavelet, processing the actually Dimitri's wavelet. Uh, 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 and so those are the areas of activation. So I'd like you to concentrate on, on this here. 
Is that the sort of area that was of interest to our colleagues who were neuroscientists? And uh, now compare that to the standard procedure SPM. Why is everyone using SPM? Because people put it on the web, in MATLAB, it's a very nice uh, uh, interface. And while well, 90% of the people do FRI use this SPM software, which does Gaussian smoothing. Okay. So you, you have a linear model and all that, but you have Gaussian smoothing. So what can you do? Either you don't smooth much, okay, so and be here bad luck because, okay, uh, you, you lost uh, somehow the, and that's the reason that we're doing Gaussian smoothing, okay, so because they're really interesting here, so they like to detect something, or you do Gaussian smoothing, okay, and, 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 and I miss the knob, okay, so, okay, here yeah, they adjusted the knob that you're detecting, but, uh, I mean, I mean here you have completely lost the uh, spatial resolution. And, 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 and so, I mean, we, we, we sort of make a case that, I mean, here you're somewhere in between, okay, so you the best of both worlds, and actually play the game, but then we incorporated that into the end, okay, so now they, they can go to their favorite software, and there's one module that's called WSPN, where they can use wavelengths. And, okay, so I, I, I think I'll finish here, because... Was a, or maybe I can show you a nice picture. Okay, so here is a extended depth of focus. So you have a, a focal series of images, and it's never like you focus everywhere. And so here's a very simple wavelet algorithm where we sort of, you know, look at uh, the places where there's maximum resolution, and we all combine them to, together and then we we'll make an image composite <coughs> that is only focus. <coughs> so conclusion: What are the important two uh, wavelet features here? I think it's a simple path implementation thanks to Mala's photonic algorithm, or maybe you could also say Bitterly and, and, and other signal processing people's uh, algorithm. It's a nice mathematical property, replaces vanishing moment. Fundamental connection with splines that we tell today, but I'll tell in two days. Um, it seems the organization of the visual uh, primary visual system, so that's an arm that will be made in favor of way that's an immensely useful application, uh, compression, filtering, denoising. Uh, inverse problems, and maybe uh, uh, a note for current topics in, in wavelength research, so uh, actually the current topic is that <laughs> everyone is working there, okay? Uh, oh, actually I, I asked Mickey to do that. No? Uh -huh. Isn't that dangerous? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, so uh, anyway, uh, he believes in that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Me too, okay. <laughs> Okay, and uh, um, then uh, there, there are uh, some uh, notable multi-dimensional uh, wavelets, actually, so, so uh, interesting uh, things one can do, a complex wavelet, which lets curve, etc. But, I mean, the difficulty is going with the features in the images. Wavelets work wonderfully in 1D, and multi in higher than 1, 2D, 3D, I mean, they're not quite able to adapt. So, 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 but uh, I mean, there's still hope, okay? Some people like us are still trying to, to do something. And uh, acknowledgements, and so now you know what this represents, okay? So this is Duplo and Lego, okay? And here, if you have a uh, triangular Legos, okay? <laughs> that, uh, uh, that's a binomial condition, and if you have quadratic spline, this is the uh, cubic splines, and so it's just the, the binomial coefficients that are uh, the two scale relation. And here up is a bibliography. And maybe let me just point out two things. Maybe this is for those who are interested in convolution. So the, the paper is on our website. So if you want, I, I think I think it's it, it, interesting because it makes this type of method usable in practice because it was to completely out of reach. If you look in a present microscope, they're very unsophisticated algorithms because it just takes too long. And with this kind of algorithms, I, I think we, we, we can bring in like the next generation and we obtain better images. And the other thing here, I, I actually this I don't know if you know about this paper. <laughs> you Nina or yeah, I, read, other, I, read it, I read it. Yeah, yeah, other, other ones who have, who have a kiss. So yes, you will know it, it's authored by M. Unzer and M. Unzer. Who is a second M. Unzer is called Matthias Unzer. Uh, at the time, he was seven years old. Uh, you notice also it's uh, published on April 1st uh, in uh, the Wavelet Digest, so you can only find it on the web. It's called Wavelet. 
So that's uh, the lowest level of vulgarization <laughs> you could try to do with, with wavelets. So, so that's the lowest level and there's a higher level up there. So thank you very much. Yeah, when, when John is a uh, two-dimensional two wavelets on the sequence of images, yes. the reason you did do three-dimensional wavelets, which would probably be the... Uh, actually, we, we do. Is it technical do. difficulty? No, no, actually we do 3D. I just I don't know that. Okay, okay. No, so, so, so uh, fMRI is, is really the job. So, so, so we do real 3D. No, but if you... So, so okay. if you have something that is time varying... Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So we don't do along the time because that's where we fit uh, this linear model. Of course, I mean, you could also do wavelet in time, and there have been, like, proposals, I, I think there's a François Meyer, and, and other people have also looked at how to use wavelet in the time period. So we were very interested in, in matching what people are using in the field. So because everyone's using this SPM, which is this uh, linear model to control paradigm, and so we wanted a, a framework that, that really matches what people are using. But of course, in your right, I think you could also throw in wavelets, uh, also in the two dimension, but then it's not a problem. Okay. Is there a question? Yeah, uh, this is a big problem. If there were no commercial and standard incumbent considerations, do you think the wavelets would have a chance to outperform a, you know, the best video compression standard algorithm such as H264? Yes, I, actually, I, I mean, Okay, I mean, let's be, be fair, like, uh, uh, I mean, video compression, most of the gain is, is, is in the prediction of the motion, okay, but uh, there, there's already, like, some kind of still uh, uh, compression, and the, like, wave gives you, like, a, let's say, 50% uh, improvement, and, and then there's some clever tricks uh, using kind of lifting schemes where people are sort of doing this prediction in, in the wavelet domain, and, you know, with, with, with some improvement, but, but then again, I mean, the problem is uh, those standards, like, if you just improve by, you know, like 20% or so, I mean, people are not going to, to change all the, the video uh, uh, equipment and, and that. And, but there's still people working on, on, on uh, you know, using, trying to just wave that to improve, uh, you know, video compared. But, I mean, the key there is motion stuff, okay? So, uh, I, I mean, and, and, and that requires lots of tricks, and, and also that it's scalable, etc. So there are all kinds of very technical issues involved. But in principle, yes, can we work that? Maybe a little more complicated. Any further questions? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank